Hi there, I'm Randy Patterson and this is Psychology Salon, a channel about psychological issues. If you like this kind of thing, click subscribe. This video is on a subject that's been on my mind recently. I'm going to talk about why I have real ambivalence about the idea of self-care, which all mental health types like me are supposed to be cheerleading for. In 1969, psychologist George Miller was the president of the American Psychological Association, and in his presidential address at the annual convention, he exhorted the membership to give psychology away. In other words, rather than treating psychological concepts as some big professional secret, we should engage in public education efforts so the population as a whole can benefit, whether or not they actually come to see us and plunk down cash for therapy. If we have the keys to a better life, let's go to the hardware store, make a bunch of copies, and hand them out to as many people as we can. Years later, when I started out in my career, this was still a real rallying cry. People would often lament the lack of public awareness of psychological issues, and we'd talk about public education and how to do it. And sure enough, there were some valuable ideas there. Yes, too much coffee can make you more anxious. Yes, you can learn to breathe in a way that helps unclench the stress response. Yes, exercise and social contact can be very helpful in creating a better life. No, alcohol is not a great way to manage your sleep. Oscar Wilde said there are only two tragedies in life. One is not getting what one wants, and the other is getting it. Well, we got it. Social media is stuffed with well-intentioned advice to help fend off mental disorder. There's a good chance you get at least 10 messages a day about this. Since COVID, the idea of maintaining your mental health has gotten even further into the public discourse. We're constantly being told about how many people are having mental health problems, how bad these are, and that we need to do something about it. Did you know that 30% of children have anxiety? Well, they don't. 100% of children have anxiety because anxiety is a normal human emotion. If you're alive, you experience it, at least some of the time. And at the core of this is the idea of self-care. We didn't used to think about our mental health all the time. You know, in the past when, despite that neglect, mental health difficulties seem to be less common than now. Weird, eh? In order to deal with this epidemic of mental illness, we're now told that we need to do self-care. And it looks like, really, you can never do enough of it. If you ask someone, what does this mean? The list is endless. You have to exercise, be fairly consistent with your sleep cycle, eat non-processed foods, prioritize social contact, overcome your perfectionism, give yourself breaks, watch your screen time, and on and on and on. Really, it's practically a full-time job. And frankly, most of these ideas aren't bad. It is a good idea to exercise some control over those building blocks of your life. I'm in favor of most of it. Not all of it, mind you. Unrealistic positive affirmations, for example, can make your life worse. And avoiding all your anxiety triggers is just about guaranteed to make your anxiety more intense. So you have to take this stuff with a grain of salt. But overall, much of it is good. My problem is with the framing of it, which is all around mental health. Why are you taking those vitamins for my mental health? Why are you going on vacation for my mental health? Why are you cycling for my mental health? Why are you having dinner with your friends for my mental health? Some of the unpleasant messages we receive in our life are given to us directly. This work is not good enough. Or your BMI may be putting you at risk for type 2 diabetes. But some of the messages are embedded. Nobody says them directly. They're just underlying assumptions stuck inside other communication. Like, 
like a pill stuck in your cat's food. You may not even realize you're swallowing it, but you are. Buried within all this good advice is an assumption. You're incredibly fragile. Your mental health is really dangling from the edge of a cliff. Any wrong move and you are going to develop a serious mental illness. Every day you need to prop yourself up in dozens of ways. You need to pick the right things on the menu, watch the right stuff on TV, walk the longer route to work, get to bed on time, and if you don't, disaster. Your mind is going to fall apart and you are, will slip into disability. So hidden inside your cat treat is a message of fragility and danger. Swallow that message enough times and you may come to believe it. By constantly talking about self-care, we may be building a society-wide belief that feeling well is actually a pretty abnormal state. The only way you're going to get there is by spending most of your waking hours propping it up. And there's a problem. Believing in your own fragility may make you more fragile. Oh my God, I didn't get enough sleep last night. Look for signs that I'm starting to crumble. The reality is that human beings evolved in a pretty difficult environment. There weren't any yoga classes. A perfectly balanced meal was hard to get. There weren't guardrails around everything. And every so often, someone you knew would get eaten. For the most part, we evolved to be pretty resilient. We don't collapse into immobility very easily unless we really believe that we do. So what am I saying? Forget your sleep cycle, cancel the gym membership, and if you like it, eat pizza at every meal, watch YouTube all day, neglect your friends and ignore your cholesterol. Well, no. As I say, much of the lifestyle stuff is actually pretty helpful. The problem isn't the picture, it's the frame. Why are you doing this? To stave off constantly threatened mental disaster? Or could it be for some other reason? Could it be that you exercise to give yourself a better life? You eat properly because in the long run, you feel better. You watch your sleep because you don't like dragging yourself around all day. You hang out with your friends because you enjoy hanging out with your friends. You do these things because they are your life. Because you want to live a good life and getting outside and having fun and shutting off the screens for a while actually does that. In other words, you don't do this stuff for prevention or because you're constantly in danger of falling apart. You do this stuff because it suits you, because you want it. And if you don't really like some aspects of your exercise regime, well, you do like the outcome of feeling better. You're going towards something. You're not constantly running away from something. You're living your life, not making every decision in fear of mental dysfunction. So in my work, I don't talk about self-care all that much. I do talk about exercise and food, and sleep, and social life, and getting into the woods, and a lot more. I like the picture. I don't like the frame. So I don't call it self-care. I call it living your life. What do you want? Let's go do it. Let's figure out some ways you can do it more. Not out of a fear of the stick of mental illness, but for the carrot of having a better life. It's much the same stuff, but achieving your goals, working towards something, is more rewarding than escaping dangers. Relief at having avoided burnout or mental collapse 
is not the same thing as living a satisfying life. So it's not self-care. It's life. It's a roadmap to the existence you want, not a perennially losing battle to fend off the illnesses that the internet keeps threatening you with. It's an existence. It's how you choose to live your life. There are other videos on this channel on the psychology of everyday life. Click the subscribe button for more. I also have an online course site, psychologysalon.teachable.com, with programs for professionals and for the general public. And my guide, The Assertiveness Workbook, is available from bookstores and online booksellers. Thanks for watching.